Hi guys, can I get a sound check? Yeah, you're good. Great, thanks. Oh, wait. So, so no. Good. Um, okay, guys, so let's see. So um, I finally, sorry about the delay in uh, grading the midterms. They're finally, the grades are finally up. And um, I also put up uh, my, my answers. Um, one of you was asking if I'll be curving the, the grades. So, you know, I was just, you know, I guess, you know, I can curve it. I, I'll try to curve it, but I'm actually not quite sure if I'll do anything because um, it, I mean, on first look to me, it looked like there were a reasonable amount of num uh, people who did better than 90 points, better than 80 points, et cetera. So <clears throat> I don't know if a curve is going to really, um, like even if I curve it, I don't know if, what it's going to do really. Um, in terms of you know the math of it, so but you know I'm, I certainly look at it, um, but I, again I, I don't there was like I don't know if the canvas had like a distribution of the grades and stuff, but I think the mean, I think the mean was around eighty three or something, something like that. It's so, eighty point six. Eighty point six. Thanks. Um, so you know I I don't know what the mean of it anyway. So. For, for whatever that's worth. Maybe a normal mean would be 75 or something. Anyway, I don't know. Um, but anyhow, so if you didn't get the grade you wanted, please look at the, um, or, or think you deserved, uh, take a look at the, um, the solutions. And, you know, we can certainly talk about it. I think generally, you know, there's, there's you know, I, I did, you know, just grading it. I could tell a difference between people who did the homework and people who didn't, um, I think. Um, like, you know, some, like it was definitely like people who were doing the homeworks were definitely on a, like a different, better path, um, I think, um, than people who didn't. I mean, it's hard to say, but, um, but the, you know, there, there were obviously here and there, I saw stuff that like, you know, I think people were trying to figure things out, but you know, the problem here and there, they like were making mistakes, perhaps again, hard to, hard to really see, but I just encourage you guys to do the homeworks um, because, because I think it'll, it'll really help. Um, so anyways, uh, are there retakes? Um, no, um, but what is, I'm not even sure what retake means, like to retake the midterm. Uh, well, um, I guess you guys are having a bunch of chats. I'm kind of like, um, you know, I'm not a professional, uh, teacher, so I'm not sure what the, 
what the implications are of the stuff you're asking. So maybe you guys could, if you have questions about your grades or about the test, et cetera, um, you could email them to me and I can sort of think through and we can have like an email conversation about uh, tests, et cetera. Um, okay, let's see. Um, and then just a reminder, guys, I, I'll put the announcement on, but our next midterm is actually next Tuesday. So, so that's coming. Um, okay, so let's get going on the bipolar. I want to kind of finish up the bipolar um, transistors today. Um, and then we can move on to bipolar amplifiers. So I think we already kind of beat to death the um, you know, doing the small signal analysis and, you know, generally the bipolar transistor. So today I'm going to talk about just kind of, again, finishing things off um, about a few different, um, um, how should I say, maybe, maybe really one thing, um, summarize it yeah i think it's just one one extra second order effect let's say so this is a this is something called the early effect and early is i think the name of the guy who found this up found found this effect it doesn't mean that it's like in time it's like earlier than anything else it's an effect where you know we talked about a bipolar transistor when it's if you have a it has a there's a three terminal device and so we can put different voltages and currents on these nodes so if you have a two-dimensional curve of voltage versus current um, we would need to make two curves to show how like, the real operating modes of this guy. One of them is the base emitter versus the collector current. And the other one is the collector emitter versus collector current. So the base emitter, if you're in forward active mode, We have a curve like this for the collector current versus the VBE, um, which is this exponential curve. curve. And the VCE curve basically is flat because our total equation, so I'm gonna write the, and is basically, well, I'll just point to this guy. Our equation here for the collector current, notice there is no term for VCE. So as long as we're in forward active mode, no matter what VCE does, I sub C stays the same. Now for different uh, VBE, so for this is for VBE is whatever it is, VBE is VBE1, and then maybe there's a bigger VBE, VBE2, you're gonna have a higher, collector current, but for each one of these VBEs, as you, as you, uh, as you span VCE, nothing changes, okay? So this is our first order model, this guy. The reality is though, that there is a small change as these, there is a, there's a small dependence on VCE, so that in fact, the current does not stay the same. So there is an extra term in this, in this model that is again, a second order effect. And this is this early, early effect. And what it comes from is, if you guys remember back to when we introduced the bipolar transistor, we have a forward bias junction. So this is the, 
This is the base. This is the emitter. And this is the collector. So this junction is forward biased. And this junction is reverse biased. And the way the transistor works is this forward biased junction, you are dumping electrons into the base. Because the base width is very narrow, these electrons will end up sooner or later, it'll end up close to this junction, the base collector junction and get swept into the collector. And so the electrons get dumped here and then from here to here. Now, as the, the, the second order effect comes from the fact that this base width is very, very narrow. That means that if, if I make this a higher reverse bias, this base collector junction, if it becomes a higher and higher reverse bias, this junction width, this depletion width is gonna grow. It doesn't grow very much. It's you know very, very small distances we're talking about. But in fact, the total width of the base is so small that as this width increases, there is a noticeable reduction in the base width. So this effect is as if we made the base width smaller with a higher base collector voltage. And if you guys remember, so the term for I sub S, we had you know, the, a bunch of things like the, the cross section of the, of, the, of the junction, and then we had doping concentration, et cetera, but then we had everything that was over the width of the base. So as this width of the effective width of the base shrinks, we would end up getting an increase in I sub S and therefore an increase in I sub C. And the way this is modeled is by, let's see, so again, the effect is, is by putting a, um, a this, this added term into our model for the I sub C function. So let's see. So basically this becomes our our total equation. Okay, so basically we have, this should be VBE. Um, so this is the term, total term for I sub C. So this is what we had. This is what we've had so far. So this is sort of a first order model. That gets multiplied by this one. And then as a second order model, this whole thing gets multiplied by the collector emitter voltage over this VA term. So VA is a, something that is sort of empirically found. What does that mean? That means when they build a bipolar transistor, they measure this thing and then they tell it to you in the specification sheet. So basically you'll have, you know, when you buy bipolar transistor or in tests or homeworks, et cetera, you'll get I sub S, you'll get beta, and then either you'll get a VA if it's infinite, means it's assuming there's no early effect. If, I, if you have an infinite value here, it means this goes to zero and you end up with your original term or it'll be some term sort of in a realistic bipolar transistor. Again, like you'll, you'll either get it in the spec sheet or you'll get it in the, um, in the test homework problem. And it might be you know 10 volts, 15 volts, 50 volts, depends on how, how straight that line is. Um, so if you BCE over I sub C, the larger the value of the 
the early curve, the early voltage, so VA is equal to infinity would be flat. And so I don't know, like VA is um, sort of 20 volts would be like that. And, you know, VA equals to 10 volts would be like that. So as the VA value goes down, there's a bigger and bigger effect of this VCE voltage on the, on the collector current. All right, so I think that's the last thing I wanted to mention. And then basically what this does is it also, so this isn't a large signal model. It also affects the small signal model because what we had in the small signal model is we had only a resistance on the input, which reflected the current going into the base. We had the transconductance times this re input resistance, but we didn't have any output impedance. So this looked like a perfect current source. But now it looks like we have a current source in parallel with the resistance. And this resistance is just the early voltage over I sub C. And you just get that by taking the derivative of VCE with respect to I sub C. And you end up with this basically. So we end up with this extra term R0, which is equal to VA over I sub C. So what does this do? It effectively, effect, effectively drops the maximum gain you can get out of this device, okay? Because imagine if you're using this device in an amplifier configuration, you would stick a resistor here. So this would be your external load resistor. And so you, whatever this is, I don't know, like a kilo ohm or 10 kilo ohm, whatever it is that you wanted to have the G sub M times this resistance would be your, your normal small signal gain. But now you are gonna have, the device itself is gonna have a resistance in parallel with this load resistance, meaning that the total resistance from the gain standpoint is gonna be less than what you expected. And in fact, the ultimately the maximum resistance that you could get out here would be limited by the resistance of the, the bipolar transistor itself. Okay, so that's the that's the early effect. Um, you know, there's this some other stuff here. We're talking about the um, the well, let's 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 keep going here. So this is um, so that was the early effect. So when you're looking at so this is a summary of the bipolar transistor. I don't know what to say about it. Again, it's, you know, we're looking in, we're, we've got the actual, how the device works and why it gives you in forward active mode, it gives you this collector current, this exponential term. We can model this as this kind of a simplified circuit with diodes and a current source. <laughs> And if we limit the behavior to a very narrow voltage range, this would be our small signal model. And this early effect basically increases, adds, a, adds an output resistance to our, to our small signal model. Um, okay, so, so that was the early effect. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about, so, you know, we keep talking about bipolar transistor being in um, in forward active mode. So, so assumption is normally that the bipolar is in forward active mode. What does that mean? That means the base emitter voltage means that the base emitter junction is forward biased. And the base collector voltage is such that the base collector junction 
is reverse biased. So in effect, it means that <clears throat> that base emitter is effectively something like you know around 800 millivolts. Again, it might be I don't know, it might be 650 millivolts to 850 millivolts. You know who knows, but it's forward active basically, forward biased. Um, and then the the this base collector junction is something higher than zero volts. So it might be 100 millivolts, 200 millivolts, zero volts, something like that. Now that's that's the forward active mode. If the base collector junction starts getting forward biased, so it's, it goes out of reverse bias, meaning this voltage, if this voltage goes too low, if it gets to the base voltage, this voltage here, if it gets to the base voltage or lower, this junction starts going into forward active mode or gets at some point, it'll go into the forward active mode. And in that case, you know, I'm not talking about the exact effects. What happens is your device basically is going to depend on this effect of this thing being straight, the collector emitter voltage and the collector current giving you a very high output impedance. These straight lines, these things, if, if this voltage goes down, basically you end up with a in a situation where this is no longer the case. So even with the early effect, so with the early effect, you're gonna have something like this. But that's not, you know, it's still very usable in terms of having a output resistance. When the device dips down like this, this is a very, very low output resistance. And basically, you're not going to get any gain out of this device. So um, not only does your gain drop, but also the speed drops. Again, I'm not going to get into why. Um, this is sort of more into um, device physics standpoint. But it's not an operating region that is is really used very much. It's usually like a very bad region to work in. So you want to kind of stay away from this region and stay in the forward active mode. But when you're not, this is called the saturation saturation region, which when you're there, it usually is like means your gain has dropped. Now you can basically push the limits here. You can have a situation where the collector goes below the base slightly. Because remember that to get, if you were going to have a diode, to go into real forward active mode, so if this was a diode, to go into forward active mode, like in a big way, you'd have to go to VD on, which again is, you know, whatever it was, 800 millivolts, 600 millivolts, whatever it was. So you could, even if you're full, you know, even if you have a lower voltage on the collector than you do on the base, you can still get away, you know, you'd be operating in kind of around here. You could still operate with a little bit of lower voltage than the base, but you can't go further than a certain point. So, you know, it's sort of an acceptable region. The book says you can make the collector voltage 400 millivolts below the base, which, you know, again, depends on the gain you want to get out of this device, et cetera. This is called a soft saturation region. So if you want to push your limits, you can operate there. Now, why would you want to do that? Let's say you have a, your power supply is low. Let's say it's like two volts or something. And you want to get a reasonable output voltage out of this device. We want to get a high output voltage out of this device. So you might be tempted to increase this. Um, so if this is um, push this resistance as high as possible. So the higher this resistor value, the higher your gain, 
but the lower this voltage. So as you're trying to increase your gain, you're putting yourself into more of a more dangerous situation that as this you're you're bringing as you're increasing this resistance you're increasing your gain but you're bringing this collector voltage down 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 and at some point you're no longer going to be in forward active mode you're going to be in full saturation well you might want to just push it to this sort of soft saturation region where you can still operate this as a acceptable um, gain um, element Let's see what I want to say. So the you know the last thing I want to say is um, any questions about those so far? Kind of going through them fairly quickly. I think we'll see them more in action in in uh, in next, the next chapter when we look at the bipolar amplifier. Um, okay, so the last one, I wanted, last thing I wanted to talk about, so these are all like the ancillary stuff here, is we've been talking about the NPN bipolar transistor so far, where we have a – so that's, that's what we have. Um, this would be base. Professor, we have uh, some questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. Uh, was there, sorry, so you wanted, Johan, you wanted to see an example? Or anybody got any questions you want to ask? Example of, sorry. I think uh, he was asking for an example for the early effect stuff. Oh, I see. Um, let me see if I can dig up an example. Um, 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 um. Uh, or maybe bipolar transistor and saturation. I know both of those were yeah. quickly gone over. Right. Let's see if I have an example for the voltage. And um, no. the book in front of me. Let's see. Let me do a think. Let's see the example. 4.14 from the book. I don't have the book in front of me. Let me see if I can grab it real quick. Sorry guys, let me pull up the book here. Hmm. Well, I don't know if these are great examples, but let's play around with them a little bit. Okay, so um, example 4.14 just says, you know, if you have a a uh, bipolar transistor and you have a collector current of one milliamp. And so let's say you have a transistor with or early voltage and without it. So let's say 
In one example, we'll look at an early voltage of being infinite, meaning no early voltage, no early effect, I guess. I don't know if you could call it early effect. So like no early effect. So, or um, uh, ideal device, you know, in quotes. And then in another case, um, let's look at an early voltage of 15 volts. And in all cases, a beta of 100. So it's asking, you know, come up with the small signal parameters. So in this case, we would basically have an R sub pi a G sub M. And that would be it, base emitter collector. That would be your small signal model. And then um, in this case, G sub M, and actually in all cases, G sub M is always I sub C over B sub T. So it's, you know, we look at our collector current, one milliamp. over 26 millivolts. And then, so we end up with one over 26 ohm of transconductance. And R sub pi would just be beta over G sub M. So it's 100 over um, one over 26 ohms. So by the way, guys, be really careful about this. It's really tempting to make this up. Like I, when I move too fast, I wanna write 100 over 26 ohms. Which is, which is obviously not correct. So remember, G sub M is a one over 26 ohms. And the units of this R sub pi should be in terms of resistance. So you end up with 2,600 ohms. And that's your model. Okay, so now with the early effect, you add a resistance here in series of RO. So you still have exactly the same things for G sub M and R sub pi. So, and then you'll have this extra term R sub zero. And R sub zero is just gonna be V sub A over I sub C. So it'd be 15 volts over um, one milliamp, so that'll be 15 kilo ohms for R out. Oh, so what does that mean? Okay, let's say we use this, but we we use each of these. This is sort of this was example 4.4. .4. So this is like an additional things I'm talking about. So this is no longer an example. So let's say you were going to use this bipolar transistor in a gain circuit. So you would have it. So same bipolar transistor. I wanna use it as a gain element. So I'm gonna put a resistor here. And so I'm not gonna figure this out quite, but let's say assume VBE is the correct value, value for I sub C is equal to one milliamp. So whatever that is, depends on the I sub S of the device and so on. So let's say if I had um, um, R sub L being, um, 15 kilo ohms for the sake of discussion. So let's say this is like five volts. It doesn't, doesn't matter for the sake of this discussion, but let's say R sub L is 15 kilo ohms. So the gain of this device, so if the early effect is infinite, that means no, so no early effect. 
So essentially, like if we had this device, my gain would be my small signal gain. would be GM times R sub L. Again, I'm assuming VB is enough to bias this thing correctly. So I have a one milliamp um, collector current and I have the right transconductance. So my transconductance is one over 26 ohms and my resistance is 15 kilo ohms. So I end up with the gain is semi calculated. Um, so I get a gain of 576 times. Everybody, everybody with me so far? Did I get that right? 15 count times GMRL. Yeah. Any questions about that so far? So basically small signal gain, I'm multiplying the transconductance by R sub L and I get the small signal gain. Now, so that was for the ideal case. Now let's see what happens if in the case of V is equal to 15 volts. Okay. Now I essentially have for this case, I essentially have another resistor here. So, so this is the early resistor. I don't know what I would call it. Early, early effect resistor. I don't know. So it's basically this R sub O that is on the output. Notice when, if I hook it up like this, so let me just draw a small signal. So this one looks like, um, So this thing looks like I got a resistor R sub L here. And I have the same situation here. And basically, in both cases, the emitter is grounded. And my VN is here. So notice because the emitter is grounded and because this is a DC voltage, I ground this end of the resistor too. So that's grounded, that's to this emitter is grounded. So effectively this output resistance caused by my early effect is in parallel with my load. So now <clears throat> when I wanna get the gain, I have to multiply G sub N of R sub L in parallel with R sub zero. Okay, so this R sub zero was 15 kilo ohms. So I think I'm gonna get, uh, this is one over 26 ohm times seven and a half kilo ohms because this is 15 kilo ohm, this is 15 kilo ohm. So my gain drops to uh, half of the 576. So basically what this early effect does is 
for the same bias current, the same voltages, I basically reduces my gain. And you know, I pick the numbers here, sort of like somewhat carefully or whatever, but um, I just so that it'd be easy to do the calculation. But if I have this 15 kilo ohms, it's lying in parallel with whatever resistance I have here. So I to keep increasing the gain, what you would try to do if you don't want to increase the I sub C is you keep increasing this load resistance, but it's not going to do you as much good because there's always like, if this was 150 kilo ohm, your total output resistance would still be kind of close to 15, kilo, you know, whatever it would be kind of close to 15 kilo ohm because you can make this as high as we want, but it's sitting in parallel with this 15 kilo ohm resistance. So this is capping, it's sort of setting a maximum resistance that you can get out of this device for a certain supply voltage. Because again, if I keep increasing this voltage, this resistor, sorry, value, I can only make it so high before this collector voltage drops low enough that this is no longer in forward active mode. So it's this is this is it's not like this this output resistance I can just do whatever I want here because you know I have limitations on the power supply, I have limitations on the power consumption and so on. So this is sort of a real painful thing to have in parallel with the output resistance in terms of the gain. So hopefully that that may that 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 makes sense about the effect of the early effect. What it's doing is it's dropping your gain essentially by dropping your output impedance. You have the highest gain is if you had an in, so this current source, if you had a perfect current source, the perfect current source has an infinite output impedance. That means the output impedance ends up being just whatever resistor you put in the load because this is infinite. But if your output impedance is low or lower, it essentially affects you, it drops your gain. Any, I think that's the primary effect of the early function. Uh, so does that any does that make sense? Is it maybe it's still going too fast um, on the early effect? But really, that's what you end up you how you end up using it is you calculate this R sub zero value and you end up putting it in parallel with whatever your load resistance is. And we're you know the very first thing we're going to talk about in the next chapter is input output impedances and you'll see how important impedance is to your gain especially to limiting your maximum gain so um, let me say one more thing so i came up by using these perfect numbers for this effect with a gain of 576 okay i don't know if it means anything to you guys i mean like, if, is, should that be reasonable? Shouldn't it be reasonable, et cetera? Well, that is probably about two orders of magnitude, or no, let's say maybe one order of magnitude, higher than what you would reasonably expect off of a circuit that you could really implement. So, you know, a, a really, a circuit that you could really implement with reasonable supply voltages, Etc. is more like a gain of maybe 50, a gain of, maybe you can have a gain of 100. So I, I think it's kind of difficult. But so again, what we'll talk about in the next chapter is a bunch of these effects that have to do with stuff around this ideal, idealized uh, amplifier and everything, like nothing improves your gain. Nothing makes things better. Um, reality just makes things worse. So everything we do, so already we lost a factor of two here um, for the early effect. And as you'll see, other factors will come in and keep dropping your gain, dropping your gain, dropping your gain. So anyway, hopefully that, that helped a little bit. 
So let's see. So I want to go back any, any, uh, in, another, um, let's see, I, don't, I didn't see another example in the chapter that made a whole lot of sense. But I think if you guys do the homework, there's some, some of the problems are have an error. So what you'll see is if the problem is saying you can ignore the early effect, the V sub A will be infinite for that problem. And if you cannot ignore the early effect, will be some other V sub A. Typically, you'll see 15 volts or 20 volts or whatever. But when you buy an actual device or you know you get a real device, it'll be whatever it is. I you know hard far from me to say if there's a typical value for early effect. Okay, so now back to our our sort of what I was talking about in terms of the types. There's another type of bipolar transistor. So we talked, we've been talking for the most part about the NPN bipolar transistor. And basically that's a sandwich of um, you know, the two N-type regions surrounding a P-type region. So that's the this would be the base emitter and collector. So the way this works is we we forward bias this, this junction. We get a bunch of electrons that go here and far fewer holes that go here because this is N plus compared to this. And then these electrons get, because this junction is reverse bias, these electrons go from here to here. And we basically get, you know, a small, a small base current controlling a large collector current effectively. Um, so you could, and, and people do, change this up so that you end up, you could do a P and P transistor. Which is also has you know the collector emitter base region. And it's like the basically, you know, it's the same kind of an idea. Now you have you can have a basically have a forward biased region. So basically in this case you will end up having a small, whoops, having a small number of electrons as the base current, and you end up dumping a bunch of holes into the base that then get absorbed uh, into the collector and sort of a similar effect, except the voltages and the currents are all reversed. So notice to get this guy forward biased, you need to get the emitter higher than the base. Okay, so to get a P region forward bias with respect to an N region, you need to get the emitter higher voltage than the base. So this would be forward bias. And same, same here, you need to get the collector to be um, lower voltage than the base. So everything is reversed compared to the NPN in terms of the uh, the operating voltages and the current is now going from because holes are positively charged. It looks like instead of the current going, so remember the electrons are going this way, but that looks like the collector currents going this way in our circuit. So let me draw the circuit diagram here. So this is our NPN. So this is. VBE, we want VBE to be, I don't know, again, 800 millivolts. And VCB, uh, we want it to be larger than zero. Although, like we said, you could push that a bit and make it larger than, you could make VCB larger than minus 400 millivolts for 
um, soft saturation. Sort of, if you're brave of heart, you could sort of drive it to that region to get higher headroom, et cetera. So this guy is the collector current is flowing this way. So the symbol for the PMP looks like the same symbol for this, except the emitter arrow is pointing this way. So it looks like this. And because, so notice that here, this is kind of conveniently drawn because Normally, we could in this, not always, but normally, our emitter is lower voltage than the base. So kind of like in, in schematic drawings, when you have something lower than something else, you actually put it below because you know your grounds are sitting here and your voltage is here. So we put the emitter down here. In this case, to turn this device on into forward active mode, we actually want the emitter to be higher voltage than the base to make it forward active. So we actually kind of flip this around. So we put the base still goes here. We put the emitter up here and we put the collector down here. And so this way we can make sure that, again, from a schematic space kind of point of view, if you put a supply voltage here, then the emitter is, you know, we can, you're basically saying the emitter can be lower than the base, sorry, higher than the base to, so let's say if this was two volts, you would want to make the base, uh, this base voltage to be say, um, I don't know, like maybe make it 1.2 volts to get a, notice this makes this a forward bias voltage, forward bias junction of 0.8 volts. Are you guys with me? Or is this getting, is this getting too, too complicated too fast? Okay, so I assume that means you guys are with me. Okay, and then you guys, like we can make this guy that's for the sake of discussion. You can put, put a resistor here if you wanted the gain out of this, or you could alternatively hook it up to ground. So basically everything is flipped from, from this NPM to this guy. So it turns out that PMP transistors are never quite as good as bipolar transistors. So like, for example, if, um, you know, typical, typical betas for, these are the current gain for NPNs, let's say it's in the 100 range. Um, so a typical beta for PMP is more like, I don't know, 20 to 40 range. So not, not as good current gain. Um, the speed of operation is usually smaller, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's, it looks like a flipped NPN device and acts in some similar ways if you put the bias in correctly, et cetera, but it's not quite as good. Let me actually put in the collector current as goes. So the collector current, oops. So the collector current flows out of the collector in this case. So, um, so the question is like, would be why would you, I mean, so you can make it, so what? Like, why would you ever want to have such a thing? Well, it turns out that when you're building more complex devices, this thing having a different polarity than this and being able to connect it in this way is a handy circuit thing. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine right now as you, as you know, I, I, I don't know how far we'll get, 
um, in terms of seeing those circuits in operation. But it turns out that if you're trying to string up a bunch of a bunch of amplifiers together to make an op amp, that um, as you go from stage to stage, or as you're trying to bias the stage, it comes in handy to have such a device. So it's always, almost always where you see PMPs is as support circuits for NPN transistors. You never really see them as um, something that you would want to build by itself. Almost never, as far as I'm as far as I've seen. Again, because it's not quite the performance isn't as good as NPN. And you usually, if you were just going to use one transistor, you typically try to get your circuit to, to work with an NPN rather than PMP. But as a support circuit for certain circuit applications, for actually some very important circuit applications to bias the NPNs, et cetera, it's really handy to have PNPs. So that's why, why they exist. Okay. So just want to introduce them. Um, in terms of like the small signal analysis and all that stuff, it's really the same as NPN, except again, everything's flipped. The voltages are all flipped in polarity. The, you know, the currents are flipped in, in flow direction because you're talking about um, primarily a whole current versus an electron current, but everything's kind of goes, goes the same way. So again, like for example, so this is the equations for PMP. Notice I sub C is looks substantially the same, except instead of VBE, it's VEB. So it means you want to make the emitter larger than the base to get a collector current going. And so just basically you're flipping polarities. Um, sort of same thing happen, happens and you know, your current's flowing in the opposite directions and so on. Um, yeah, and so here, you know, here's an example of the, boy, the look, anyway, looks like it was sort of similar to what, what I was talking about there. Um, similar small signal analysis, et cetera. You guys want to do some, um, let's see, do you want to do some examples? Let's see. Uh, I'm kind of trying to figure out like how far I want to get into this, these examples. Um, 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 um. This is an NPN. No, nah, I mean, I mean, to me, it's kind of like it's sort of an, a pretty obvious flipped version of the NPN. I'm not sure what I would have to add to the analysis, except just be careful. You know, make sure your you know voltage polarities like things are connected. Well, what the heck? Let's just do a quick. Let me just show you guys this thing, and just we won't do any actual numbers, but we'll just sort of make sure you guys get the, the voltages, et cetera. So um, let me go back to here. So let's, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, here we were. So let me just make it small, just, just draw the small signal models in each of these cases. So I think the NPN on the NPN side, we're pretty familiar with it. So the NPN, it looks like you have a um, R sub pi, VP plus minus, and GM 
e sub pi. And here you have a resistor connected to ground. Then your emitter is connected to ground. And your, let's say I had, this is my V in. And then I had a battery here, which had a proper VBE. So notice that whenever in the small signal domain, whenever I have a voltage source like this, that's equivalent to a short. So anytime I have anytime you have this in large large signal, you want to change that into a short in small signal. And so we've been doing that. For the last few lectures, we basically replace when we do a small signal model of this guy, we basically short through this guy. We end this ends up being grounded in the small signal model, like we have here. The emitter is already grounded, and our input is stuff that's external. So this guy is my input. And then this guy also gets grounded, so it just looks like like this. So I have my input uh, puts a voltage across R sub pi, and then I end up with, with a GM V sub pi times R sub L on the output. Now let's look, let's look at what the um, PMP small signal model looks like. Okay, so the small signal model for the PMP is, um, I'm trying to set it up so that it won't confuse you guys too much. Let's see. Okay, so, um, hmm. let me first draw it like it would be, it would kind of translate it here. So just again, you have to look at this, think of the small signal model. So the emitter is sitting here connected to the supply, but the supply now it's going to be looks like a short. Okay, so if I'm like looking at the emitter, oops, I'm going to flip it over here. Let's see. So I have a I'll draw this. So I have a VN going to ground. That's my input. So the input would be um, Here. So it would be a VN, and I would short this battery to ground. So you get to short the battery to ground. This shows up across our supply here. My emitter This guy is a voltage source, so I'll short that to ground also in my small signal model. And then I have my collector, which gets G sub M. 
Now notice the current, the G sub M current is going the other way, right? It's going flowing this way. Okay, and then I have my, if I have an early effect, I'll also have an R sub zero. And then the collector sees it's got this resistor here going to ground. So I just transfer that over. I got a resistor to ground. Okay, so that's what the NPN small signal looks like. And this is what the PNP small signal looks like. So it's really the same, except, you know, you're just flipping things over, same equations for both, for G sub M, R sub zero, and R sub pi. Again, I've put just everything as, is reversed. What else do I want to say? Anyway, I think that's what I, all I wanted to say for PMPs. Mm, it just, again, everything's flipped. I, I don't, yeah. And, you know, it's not as good, but it's, it's useful for certain, certain things. Okay, now let's, so I'm gonna st stop it there. Any questions about the, so this was all the stuff on chapter four, which is we're talking about bipolar transistors, how you wanna operate them in forward active mode, whether it's NPN or PNP, and sort of some examples of how you could use them as gain elements, and then the small signal model for them, and this second order effect called early voltage. That's kind of a summary of the chapter four in, you know, in, in a minute or less. Any, any questions about that? I don't know if you guys have started looking at the homeworks, but again, I strongly suggest doing the homeworks for the midterm. I think it'll be really helpful. Um, any questions before we move on to chapter five? No, okay. So let's see. Um, so let's see. to Okay, so this is, we're moving on to chapter five. And so in chapter four, we talked about just a bipolar transistor. And we did a real simple example of, or maybe not so simple example of how to hook it up as an, as an amplifier. And some biasing examples, etc. So this was uh, this is the a um, bipolar NPN amplifier. And so we're gonna we're gonna work off of this and um, look at it in sort of more detail. So. What we're gonna talk about is all the stuff that goes around us. So again, this this thing, um, you know, we put in uh, input, we put in a battery here to get it biased properly. Um, we really haven't said much about what this input looks like. We haven't talked much about what this 
thing is driving. It turns out that for realistic situations, when you're really building this thing in the real world, this input has some typical characteristics. So it's not gonna look like a perfect voltage source. It has a certain output impedance, et cetera, of itself. So, I mean, this might be another amplifier like this driving this guy as you're trying to have multiple gain stages. And so this guy, because it has this R sub pi input, et cetera, this guy is affecting this thing that's driving it, just, just sitting here and being driven. It's not neutral. It's gonna load whatever is driving it down. Same with itself. If you're driving another circuit like itself or some other circuit period, that load, whatever you're driving, is gonna affect the performance of this guy. Okay, so that's input output impedances. We're gonna talk about that, about how stuff that doesn't have infinite output impedance, drivers that don't have infinite output impedance, which means pretty much everything, and loads that don't have infinite input impedance will reduce this overall gain. Like I mentioned, um, like with all things in the world, you know, it seems like everything's set up to sort of work against your purpose, but because we wanna make a gain element, it just seems like the entire universe is trying to bring down our gain. So all these effects, not, nothing works to accidentally increase your gain. Everything is working to reduce the gain that we can get out of this device. So these are the impedances. So that's the input and output impedance. Then we're going to talk about you know how you know we just drew this this battery as if we can just throw batteries here and there in our circuits, but batteries are big, um, they are expensive. Like imagine if you had, you know, I don't know, like thousands and thousands of these devices and you wanted to put in a battery for each one. Think about how much that would cost and th think of how big that would be. So basically putting a battery here was good to show how this could potentially get biased, but a realistic biasing circuit is not a battery. It's made out of some other components, mainly resistors, that can be very, can be inexpensive and physically small. Okay, so we're gonna talk about biasing circuits. And so the downside of those resistors, et cetera, and these biasing circuits, is you know batteries this this ideal battery is really nice you know we can we can just buy writing here we can make it whatever we want but in reality these resistors etc there's limitations to the values we can get there are variations in these resistor values that we have to worry about etc so there are biasing circuits that are better than other biasing circuits and usually it comes down to how robust they are, how repeatable in a production or in a realistic environment it's gonna be. And then lastly, we're talking to get more into detail. We're doing the, um, the, 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 the analysis, okay? Then we're gonna talk about some more, um, some circuits that will make I think a lot of what you guys will see, um, I think the main pattern I'm hoping you'll see in chapter five is, is the importance of making your circuits robust. So a lot of the work, so you know, if, if this worked in a realistic situation, if it was low cost, if you could replicate it, et cetera, we wouldn't, we would just sort of stop here and use this for everything. But it turns out that it has like a bunch of limitations, um, you know, being cost, being, 
being um, how robust this is in a production environment that everything varying you know every every transistor you buy is going to be a little bit different every resistor you buy is going to be a little different every power supply is going to be a little different uh, you know we keep saying the you know v sub t is um, 26 millivolts at room temperature and leave it at that but what if you know, you're selling this as a product and, you know, you don't know if your customer is only going to use it in an air conditioned room. Maybe your customer is going to use it from, you know, go to some really cold places and go to some really hot places. So that, you know, that you, that same circuit has to work over these things, over this range of operations. So you can't just say, VT is 26 millivolts at room temperature and leave it at that. VT is going to be all over the place. Okay. And so were some of these other parameters. So we're going to talk about that. And then lastly, we've talked about this circuit to what's called the topology, which is this connection with the emitter on the ground, uh, the input going to the base and the collector being biased and the output coming out like this. This is called the common emitter stage, but there are a couple of other types of um, um, types of topologies that we can connect this transistor up. Remember, we have three terminals, so there's a bunch of different ways to connect this up, and we're going to talk about a few of those cases: the common base stage and the emitter follower stage, that also are useful in different ways than this topology. And we're going to talk about how we use those. Okay, guys. So I'm going to leave it at that. Any questions? Okay. If not, I will um, talk to you guys on um, Thursday. Take care. If you got uh, questions about your midterm, just go ahead and shoot me an email. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yeah. On the syllabus, it says there's a 6% for class activities. I was just wondering what exactly those are. What are the class activities? Yeah. What you're doing, you know, asking questions, being involved in the class activity. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, it's kind of like a, it's really, honestly, it's kind of like a fudge factor for me to use to um, bump stuff up for people who are like actively involved in the class, I feel. Gotcha, all right. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks.